Okay, so we're gonna be prepping the lower right second primary molar. Uh, step one is occlusal reduction. You'll need a millimeter and a half of occlusal reduction. There's many ways to do, uh, use the depth cut feature of this, but probably the easiest way is to just make a trough down the center of the tooth, the thickness of this burr. And once again, I'm going more slowly than normal just for demonstration purposes. But if you make a trough, the thickness of this burr, right down the middle of the tooth, you can actually see. So if you look from the side view, let's see if we can get this on camera, the depth of that burr, just make a little slot or trough, the depth of that burr, and that's your millimeter and a half of reduction. And once you make that trough right down the middle, the depth of that burr, which is a millimeter and a half, then you can go back and flatten out everything else to match. Remember with easy crowns, all you need is a flat, occlusal reduction. You don't need a fancy prep that's deeper in the central fossa or more challenging to prep. You just need a nice flat occlusal reduction like that. So there's two visual cues I'd like to use. When you're done with your occlusal reduction, if you still have the central anatomy or the anatomy of the tooth still there, um, you'll see just a little pit or the depth of the or the deepest part of the central fossa will still be remaining. You'll see like a little dot right there and that's usually enough reduction. Um, secondly, I also like to use the uh, marginal ridges of the adjacent teeth. If you look at the prep from the side, you should, you should see that your prep is down a little bit from the marginal ridges of the adjacent teeth. So that's our occlusal reduction, flat 1.5 millimeters. Very simple. Now we're going to go ahead and do our step two, which is our gross reduction racetrack axial depth cut. And as I talked about in my prior videos, whenever I'm doing my racetrack, I like to make a little line right at the tissue level. It's almost like if we're sketching or drawing, we make a little line right at the tissue level, right where we want it. And then once we get that line where we want it, then we're going to go back and forth over and over again until we develop that line and eventually it becomes our shoulder margin, which is our racetrack axial depth cut. The thickness of this burr is 0.8 millimeters, which is the amount of axial reduction that you're gonna need to do. Um, I know some people like to do depth cuts along the, out of the outer part of the tooth. I'm not a big fan of depth cuts. And the reason why is sometimes you can go too much um, doing your depth cut or when you're trying to get rid of your depth cut, you end up having lots of little notches in the side of your tooth. And I always worry that you're gonna prep away more than you need to if you're doing depth cuts. So if you do it this way, you can kind of see right from the occlusal here, go ahead and blow that off for me. You can see by doing this racetrack, the thickness of this burr, that is the thickness of the burr. You can see it right there. That's 0.8 millimeters. You can look at it from the side. So you can see I've made a depth cut or racetrack or shoulder margin, the thickness of this burr, which is 0.8 millimeters. Once again on the lingual, you can make a little line right along the tissue level. Remember we're prepping to the gum line, we're actually not prepping subgingival yet. We will do the subgingival reduction when we do the next step. So you wanna make sure and have a nice, clearly defined racetrack or depth cut, which is the thickness of this burr, which is 0.8 millimeters at the tissue level. So if we compare 
we can kind of take a look here. I'll wipe this off. But if you look at it from this view, you can see a nice defined racetrack here, the thickness of that burr. If you look on the inside, that racetrack is starting to appear, but it's still a little bit faint. One of the visual cues for this second step, the racetrack axial depth cut, um, gross reduction racetrack axial depth cut, you want to be able to clearly see that racetrack immediately. If it's indistinct or faint, you want to go back and develop that a little bit more. So I'm going to go back and just develop that racetrack a little bit more. There we go. So now I can see that. And then in approximately, do our interproximal reduction. When I go through interproximally, I'm following the side of the burr, barely missing the tooth I'm not prepping. So that's the way we can go in interproximally without creating preparation on the tooth that we don't want to prep. And then on the mesial. Going through there. And then when that's all done, I'm going to go back around and just follow my racetrack all the way around. There we go. Now we can take a look at this. Um, you can see clearly the racetrack is visible all the way around the tooth, the thickness is visible all the way around the tooth, the thickness of that burr. And then a lot, uh, a lot of times people ask me about the contact right here. Do I need to break contact at this gross reduction racetrack axial depth cut step? And you don't because when you come back with your flame diamond, that's going to go away. So don't worry about it if it's touching the adjacent teeth right here because that's going to go away when we do our subgingival reduction. And then the last step is we're going to do our subgingival or below the tissue reduction. And remember we talked about in prior videos that where you enter the tissue makes a difference. You want to enter where the tissue is the firmest. The best way to create or achieve hemostasis is not to create bleeding in the first place. And by your preparation and being able to master the preparation, you can cause less tissue trauma. If you enter in on the straight buckle, the tissue's thin and more likely to tear. So it's better to enter in right by the papilla on the mesiofacial line angle here or on the distofacial line angle here. And then when you come in, remember, we want to be straight up and down, correct? Because we're making a cylinder. The only time that I'm not straight up and down is when I'm doing my initial entry under the tissue. I'll come in at an angle, slightly tapered. I'll make a little hole um, about halfway in. I don't go all the way in yet. I make a little hole about halfway in with my burr angled. And then I start to fan out from that point. And once that ledge starts to disappear, then I have more room in my sulcus. Now I can upright my burr. You can see how I'm holding my burr straight up and down. Now I can upright my burr, drop it the rest of the distance that it needs to go. You can see there, and I'm straight up and down and I'm going much further subgingival to get that nice cylindrical shape that we're, that we're shooting for. And I'll do the entire buckle surface, flatten that out. So that's done. During this step here, you always want to go back and check to make sure you didn't leave any ledges. So you can go root to tooth, root to tooth, root to tooth, past the CEJ after you finish that buckle and feel for any ledges. Some people like to go from root to tooth and feel for a ledge. I actually like to push down. I go from tooth to root in the opposite direction. It's easier for me to feel a ledge if I push down. The other thing that you want to consider is that when you're prepping, you're straight up and down this way because you're creating a cylinder, right? You don't want any taper. But if you try to feel for a ledge with your flame diamond, you might not feel it. You might slip plastic. So if you're checking, you want to come in from an angle, like a 45 degree angle or even a 90 degree angle, and you're using your basically using your flame diamond as an explorer, feeling for any ledges there. So remember, prepping straight up and down, we're creating a cylinder, no taper 
checking come in from an angle and go root to tooth or tooth to root, either way. All right, so I did the buckle surface. Now we're gonna do the lingual surface. Once again, same thing. I'm gonna go in here and make a small little hole. And then I'm gonna have an, a little bit of an angle as I peel away or take away that ledge, the sulcus starts to open up and now I can go and drop my burr the full millimeter and a half or two millimeters that you need to do to get that nice cylindrical shape. So you can see how I'm straight up and down here. I'm gonna do that buckle surface and then I'm gonna go ahead and do my interproximally last. So usually I'll do buckle, interproximal, then I do lingual. That's my normal, that's my normal routine. But it doesn't matter. What matters is you do it the same way every time. So you develop a system because that's how you're gonna get faster at prepping these crowns. Once again, gonna come in, a little bit of an angle. Once the lead starts to disappear, then you're gonna upright your burr. And once that ledge is all gone, then you're gonna go around the tooth, ring around the rosy. One, two, three, four, five. If I'm actually in the clinic, you'll see me do it really fast like this. But once again, I'm trying to demonstrate for the purpose of this video how to do this. So what is the purpose of the ring around the rosy step, that last step? Well, it eliminates any rough spots or ledges below the tissue. And then lastly, what it does is it helps you feel if you have done your subgingival reduction correctly. You can either feel for any ledges there, or if you're just going around the tooth, it'll either feel bumpy or it'll feel smooth. When it feels smooth, you know there's no ledges. If you feel a bump, like say there's a bump right here, like smooth, 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 bump, bump, smooth, 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 bump, bump, where you feel that bump, go back, smooth that out till it's gone, and then once you go around, everything feels nice and smooth, you know you're done. You don't even have to go back with practice. You don't even have to go back and feel. You know just by how it feels, smooth or bumpy, that you've done your subgingival reduction correctly. Um, the last question is, do we want to round these edges here? So that's an option. You can either leave them square or you can go back if you want and just lightly round those a little bit. Most doctors end up just leaving them square. You don't need to go back and round them if you don't want to. And then the moment of truth, we try our crown on. See how it fits, it should drop on there. And it does, so that crown's seated, first try. If you follow the steps taught here, your crowns will seat first try the vast majority of the time. And that's it.